sermon tonight. Now, if you missed this morning's sermon, I preached, the, the title of my sermon was uh, Flat Earth Foolishness, okay? I, uh, it's unfortunate to even have to preach something like that. I didn't really want to preach on the subject because I feel like I'm wasting the time of a lot of people having to even go through the content. However, uh, for whatever reason, it's a thing and, and some people fall for this stuff and it's, and it's sad and I wish it didn't happen, but it does. So I covered, I spent a long time this morning and I am not planning on re-preaching that sermon ever. So hopefully the recording is good and I can just, if someone has a question on that, you can just see the sermon that was preached this morning. That's how I feel about it. Just a couple weeks ago, I preached a sermon on you know, the importance of being intelligent, of being smart. God doesn't want us to be a bunch of dummies. Okay, this is important, and I'm going to stress this. I, I preached on having high standards. There's a common theme, and there's a reason why I've been preaching some of the things I've been preaching lately, because they're important. Because, look, what, the main objective of our church, one of the main goals, is to reach people with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Is it not? Right? That's one of the main things that drives us all together. We're born-again believers. We want to reach people with the gospel of Jesus Christ. And in so doing, we want to have the best testimony that we can have. We want to be the best workers, the best laborers, so that God could use us the best. That's the reason why we want to get a lot of sin out of our life. Okay, we want God to use us. We want people to, to look at us and not say, oh boy, here's just another hypocrite. We want people to understand and see, hey, here's people that actually believes the Bible. Here's people that believes God's word. And not only are they just going to talk about it, we're going to live it and do it. Okay, that's important. And when you hold yourself to a high standard, people will recognize that and see these people aren't screwing around. This isn't just a joke. This isn't just some hobby. This is an actual way of life. On top of that, we ought to have be able to use good reasoning skills and good comprehension and be able to hold a thought and be able to present an argument so that we can convince people. Because yes, people need to be convinced of the fact that they're a sinner. They need to be convinced that they deserve hell. They need to be convinced that Jesus Christ shed his blood and died on the cross for them. And they need to be convinced that they have to put their trust and their faith in Jesus Christ in order to be saved. Amen. You need to be able to present information and be able to handle objections and be able to spot you know false arguments and and when and just just all kinds of things to be able to help you to do your job on top of that you need to be on guard against heretics against false prophets against false teachers that are out there that are lying in wait to deceive the bible says that they're you know the, that they're um they use guile, they use cunning craftiness, and they twist the word of God. They try to change the word of God and teach things that aren't true. Amen. So I've been teaching, covering these different topics lately, and that's kind of, again, the purpose for tonight is almost an offshoot of what I was preaching this morning. And the title of my sermon tonight is, Let Us Reason Together. And we saw in Isaiah chapter 1, if you want to look down at verse number 14, the Bible says, Your new moons and your appointed feasts my soul hateth. They are a trouble unto me. I am weary to bear them. And when ye spread forth your hands, I will hide mine eyes from you. Yea, when ye make many prayers, I will not hear. Your hands are full of blood. Wash you and make you clean. Put away the evil of your doings from before mine eyes. Cease to do evil. Learn to do well. Seek judgment. Relieve the oppressed. Judge the fatherless, plead for the widow. Come now and let us reason together, saith the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. If ye be willing and obedient, ye shall eat the good of the land. But if ye refuse and rebel, ye shall be devoured with the sword, for the mouth of the Lord hath spoken it. What we see in this passage is the people, the children of Israel, they're going through the motions with their religion. They're holding their new moons and their feasts. But God's saying, I'm weary with what you're doing. You're wearing me out because you're not getting the point at all. You're just, you're just going through these motions, going through these steps. He said, when you spread forth your hands, I'm going to hide my eyes from you. I don't even want to see you going through these motions and having this really religious event going on and raising your hands in prayer and worship. He says, I'm going to hide my eyes from you. Why? Because your hands are full of blood. 
So you're going through all these motions and you're just, it's not that they're just a bunch of sinners, but they're just doing, they're, they're off in wickedness. He says, wash you, make you clean. Put away the evil of your doings from before mine eyes. Cease to do evil, learn to do well. And now he's saying, look, stop doing bad, stop doing wrong and start doing what's right. The Bible says elsewhere, you know, that uh, obedience is better than sacrifice. God's not as impressed with the fact that you show up to church and you make these great prayers and you, you oh, I've sacrificed my time or I've given this big money offering and the offering. But he's not impressed with that if you're just living in disobedience. He'd rather just have you obey him and just do what he asks you to do than, than to give some big gift. And these people, yeah, they're, they're, they're having their feasts and they're bringing their sacrifices but they're not having respect unto God's commandments and God's laws. So what he says here, he says, come now, let us reason together. Just think about this. Let's reason this out, okay? Just, just sit down and, and, and shut up and think about this and we'll reason together about this. Because God is a reasonable God. God wants us to understand the things that God does. It's not just on a whim. It's not just like God some, some you know, <laughs> Weird being that's just whatever, you know, whatever I want to do. Like God's all powerful, but, it, but, but there's always reasoning and there's good reason behind it. God is a logical God. Come now, let's reason together. He says, though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they, crimson, they shall be as wool. If you be willing and obedient, you shall eat the good of the land. But if you refuse and rebel, you shall be devoured with the sword, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken it. Let's reason about this. Let's think about this for a minute. You could either be willing and obedient and just have things going well for you and be blessed, or you could just be disobedient and rebel and refuse and have all kinds of cursing and stuff. Which one do you want to choose? This is God reasoning with the children of Israel. This is something that we're trying to do. As I mentioned already, we want to reason with people, and it's something that we have to be able to do is be able to reason and not be duped and not try to dupe people either. We need to learn how to give good arguments. We need to learn how to be smart about this and to be able to, to take your faith and take the word of God and handle it with integrity and with honesty. So many people are so sick of religious people coming to their door, trying to talk to them and just yanking verses out of context and trying to throw it at them because they're, they're totally just expecting you to be ignorant of God's word and, and have no clue what the Bible's talking about so they could just tell you whatever they want to tell you. Yep. And that's not the way that anybody ought to be and that's not the way that we're going to be in this church. And I don't care if you have the right doctrine you still ought not to mishandle the word of God just to, to feel like you, you, you want to just add so much more evidence to somebody on whatever it is you're trying to teach them. Don't take verses out of context. Don't do it. It's going to hurt your testimony. You may think, oh man, but here's this verse and it's going to preach so well. And man, and I could really drive this point home, but it's not what it's talking about at all. Don't use it. Be honest when you handle the scripture because you will end up doing more damage to your testimony if that person then finds out, like they read it later and go, that's not what this is talking about at all. You, you don't want to have that happen. Even if what you're saying, what you're trying to teach is right or true, don't go there. You don't need to. If something's true, if something's right, you don't need to add unto it. You don't need to come up with different ways that, that aren't right and, and use different scriptures that aren't really saying that to prove it. If something's true, you should have enough other scriptures to use to prove it that are clear and that are saying exactly what you're trying to teach. The Bible says we need to prove all things and hold fast to that which is good. So in order to prove things, you need to test it. That's what prove means. And when you hear and and you know what? I'll, I'll continue to say this as long as I'm the pastor here. Prove what I'm saying. Don't believe or trust any pastor because of the pastor. Don't just listen blindly to anybody. Prove all things. Test what you're hearing. Verify in the word of God, is this right and true? That's your responsibility. 
Don't go leaving everything up to the pastor to just tell you how things are. Look, come in here and learn. Hopefully there's things that I know that I have wisdom of that God's taught me that I've learned along the way that I can teach to you and, and relay that to you and you could learn something. That's the goal. But don't just blindly accept whatever's coming out of my mouth. You have a responsibility to know what you believe and why you believe it. We ought to be above the mishandling of Scripture because, like I said, that's going to do way, way too much problem. Now, what I'm going to do tonight, again, this is a little bit different style and different type of sermon, and I hope it's not too boring, but I'm going to make some points. I actually copied some logical fallacies down. Okay, logical fallacies are not Bible verses, right? We're not, so I'm not doing a normal really in-depth type of, of Bible study or going on a Bible topic. But this is important in this being able to identify when people are using logical fallacies. One, to be able to spot where people are using them on you to get you to believe something. And two, so that you don't fall into this trap of using a logical fallacy with someone else when trying to convince them of something that you believe. Okay, so, so it works both ways here and it should be beneficial for you. What, we, what you heard this morning had a lot of fallacies. When I, when I went through all of those supposed Bible verses to prove the flat earth, so what I did was I demonstrated this morning how ridiculous the argumentation was, but without going into specifics on what you would call that specific fallacy or this, you know. But tonight I'm going to bring up some names. And you know what? The names really aren't that important. It's the concepts. There's things to look out for. So you don't, you don't have to know what all these are. A lot of these, I've never heard the name of them before, but I, you understand the concept. That's what we're going to be looking at tonight. So, and then I'm going to be using, giving some uh, examples of how people perform these fallacies from Scripture from, with different doctrines and things. So I don't know how long we're going to go tonight. Probably not too long. But let's see how it goes. So the first one I have, and this is in no particular order. It's an etymological fallacy. So if you know the etymology of something, it's where its origin is, where its source is. So if you're really interested in language and, and words, English language, you can look at the etymology. Where does that root word come from? We have a lot of words that come from Germanic languages and also from Latin languages. So you go back and find, well, where did this word in English come from? And you kind of go back and trace it back and understand a little bit more about the word. But the fallacy is the, it says the reasoning that the original or historical meaning of a word or phrase is necessarily similar to its actual present day usage. So people will take uh, uh, the etymology of a word just because a word used to mean something, they'll apply it today to have that same meaning even when it doesn't today. And vice versa, you can do the same thing the other direction. And it's probably more common since I'm going to be applying these to Scripture. These are fallacies that are just fallacies no matter what you're talking about. Okay, this is just completely like I got these, this list off of Wikipedia. Okay, it's just common fallacies that any type of argumentation, you could find them out there. People have identified, you know, this, don't fall for this, don't fall for this, because this is not a proper way of actually making an argument. Right. It falls short, it fails. That's why it's a fallacy, because you're failing. One way that this, and this is tied in closely with uh, what, what is called equivocation, the misleading use of a term with more than one meaning by glossing over which meaning is intended at a particular time. So some words have dual meanings. And the more you read the Bible, the more you should understand that. And especially the more you study the Bible, you're looking at it and going, wow, you know, this has this meaning in this context and then another meaning in a different context, even though it's the same word. That is extremely important because it's easy for people to get confused about that and people who are bad people will use that, you know, the ignorance of others against them. Right. And people do do that. Now, some people just, they, they may be 
just honestly mistaken and don't know any better, but other people will use these fallacies as kind of more like, I call it weaponized against them. Now, there's an example of this just to help you understand these fallacies is the usage of the word wine in the Bible. Wine is a perfect example. Wine, when you come across the word wine in the Bible, the beverage, the drink, it has a dual meaning. Sometimes it's referring to the alcoholic beverage that you would probably think of when you hear the word wine today. You go to the beer and wine aisle at the grocery store, that wine. That usage is found in Scripture. But I'm going to tell you, that's not the only usage of the word wine in Scripture. Wine is also used to define a, a beverage, a juice that comes from fruit that is not fermented, that is non-alcoholic, that we would just call juice. We today, in our modern tongue, will say juice and wine to separate those two drinks. Well, in the 1600s, in the 1500s, 1600s, when English was used during the time of the translation of the King James Bible, wine was used to refer to either or. And the way you know the difference is by looking at the context. And the context in Scripture is actually very easy to spot because it's either extremely positive or it's extremely negative. You go from the Bible calling wine the, the vine of the vine of Sodom, the, the venom of, of asps and of dragons, and, and just being something that look not thou upon the wine when it is red, when it gave it this color in the cup. You can read Proverbs 23, and it just condemns, you know, wine. But then you also see the praises of wine that, that makes the heart of man glad. And, and other blessings are found with wine. Two extreme opposites, obviously not referring to the same beverage. That is an important distinction. And when you go back, here's where you have to go back to the etymology of the word. You can see, not necessarily from the origin of the word, but if you go back and look at the usage of the word back in, the, in, in that time frame, you can find, I've already done the work on this. I've done the research for myself. You don't have to take my word for it. It's not easy to find, but you can find sources that are referring to non-alcoholic drinks as being wine completely outside of the Bible. So it's not just specifically a religion thing or a Bible thing. It's just a word usage thing. It's just what was commonly referred to 400 years ago in the English language. Right. I'm just going to have some wine. We were, we were kind of joking the other day. We had, we had some grape juice at lunch. We were working here in the building. We got some Jimmy John's, and, and I brought out the grape juice that we had in the refrigerator. And he goes, so I'm going to have some wine with my lunch. Okay? Now, that is a proper usage, biblically speaking, of the term. Drinking some grape juice. There's nothing wrong with that. Now, it's not common today, which is why we're kind of joking, because if we were to say that, you know, just to someone else outside of our group, they're going to think that we're drinking booze, but we're not. And um, so the Bible has this, this dual meaning, and you have to be aware of that. Now, that's just one example. There's plenty of other examples like that in Scripture. You need to be aware of these things. Um, obviously, you don't know but what you don't know, so you might not always be aware of dual meaning of words, but just be aware that it exists, and especially when you hear something that sounds kind of odd or sounds kind of weird, like... I mean, does this not sound weird, saying, someone saying, well, Jesus turned water into wine, and he was at this wedding, and there was a great party, and they were all drunk, and he gave them more wine. Does that sound like something that Jesus would do? The Jesus that you know, he's going to, hey, these people are all drunk. Let's give them another keg. Let's give them some more booze. That doesn't sound right. right. That doesn't sound like the Jesus that I know. When the Bible condemns drunkenness, something doesn't add up there. Hold on a minute. Let me check this out. Dig into it a little bit deeper. And then maybe you'll start to see the difference there. And, you know, uh, since I'm on this, and I know I've got a little bit of extra time, and this is a, a, a topic, a hot-button topic for me personally, because this is something that, that is destroying people and has always destroyed people throughout history. In John chapter 2, the very place that Jesus Christ turned water into wine, the, the one place that, that everybody, look, I was guilty of this too, Back when I liked to drink, 
what anybody who wants to justify their sin is going to say is, well, Jesus turned water into wine. Yeah. That is the number one most common argument you're going to hear from a Christian that wants to justify drinking alcohol. Well, Jesus turned water into wine. Yeah, you know what? Why don't you go ahead and read John chapter 2 and see what he's talking about? Because when they ran out of wine at the feast, his mother comes up to him, Mary says, hey, they ran out of wine. And Jesus goes, woman, mine hour has not yet come. Why did he say that? Because he's showing that the wine is symbolic of his blood. His hour, meaning his death. His shedding his blood. So right off the bat, he is making equivalence or symbolism of the wine that he's providing for them with his own blood. This is extremely important because Jesus Christ is sinless. This is why when the Passover lamb in the Old Testament was given, it had to be a perfect lamb without spot or blemish, right? The sacrifice that was made, that Passover lamb had to be perfect. It was critical. They had to look at it and examine it and make sure it's good. It's legit. And not only that, when it was given, the other sacrifice that went with it, the offering, was unleavened bread. Why was it unleavened? Because it's representing the flesh that, that is sinless. It has to be unleavened. Leaven represents sin in the Bible. Well, Jesus, his flesh, was, he was without sin. So if you're going to represent his body and his blood, you can't have sin represented. If leaven represents sin, leaven is something that's put into bread. What is leaven? It's a yeast, right? Well, when you go to a drink, you don't have leaven, but you have a different yeast. That's where the fermentation comes from to create an alcoholic beverage. So the same thing that's represented as sin in the bread, you think that he's going to serve them alcohol when he's already referenced that wine as being symbolic of his own blood. Of course not. That would be blasphemous for him to produce something that was representative or symbolic of sin. On top of that, just adding booze upon booze, I'll tell you this, they weren't getting drunk at all at that party because Jesus, while he did speak to sinners, while he did talk to prostitutes, he did preach the gospel to people, he did try to reach people, he wouldn't just be hanging out and partying with people who were all just getting drunk around him. Right. He would give the gospel to people, but I guarantee you he's not just going to go and, and just be participating in a big drunken party. Anyway, I'm going to get off that subject. I could go on and on because that's not even the only, just in John chapter 2, reasons to, to demonstrate how just because the word wine is used, it doesn't mean it's alcohol. I don't want to get too far off because I'll could. i just preach the whole time on that and, and I've got way too many. This is supposed to be on logical fallacies. All right. Let's look at the next one. Fallacy of quoting out of context. Okay, this is, this is like geared for the Bible. I said, this is, these aren't Bible things, but I, I, I did. Okay, I cherry-picked, which we're going to get to that, which is another fallacy. So forgive me for that one. I cherry-picked through the fallacies to find ones that are much more pertinent for religion, for the Bible, for, for how it's going to apply to us, okay? Because we're not going to be getting involved in like big serious debates and, and you know, those types of proofs, but we are going to be um, hearing teaching and trying to teach people, so... Fallacy of quoting out of context refers to the selective excer ex excer excerpting excuse me, of words from their original context in a way that distorts the source's intended meaning. Jehovah's Witnesses are famous for that. Just taking out bits and pieces of the Bible to try to tell you that it means something when you look at the context. It's not just Jehovah's Witnesses. A lot of people are, are fall for the same exact type of logical fallacy of just yanking a verse out of context. I mean, you literally could prove just about anything you want to, depending on how much you, you want to butcher the Bible to make the Bible say whatever you want it to say. Which is why anytime, here's what I encourage, anytime you're going to have a discussion about the Bible, use the Bible. If you're going to talk about doctrine, if you're going to talk about what's right and wrong, you're talking about different things in the Bible, don't just talk about Scripture. 
Because usually people don't have all the verses just memorized in their head. And people oftentimes will misremember things and maybe even have already misinterpreted a passage, but that's all they remember is their understanding of it. But when you're actually talking about it and you go to the passage, you'll be like, oh, well, that's actually what it says. Oh, I was a little bit off on that. And look, this is the word of God. We want to we want to take it seriously and make sure that you don't fall guilty of quoting something out of context that you're getting. Hey, what does this really mean? And if someone's trying to teach you something, always get the context. And this is why I have the sermon notes on the back. So in case I'm going a little bit too fast through the sermon or I just hit a point, hit a verse here, hit a verse there, you can write down the reference and check it later for yourself and just make sure that is that really what that's saying? Okay, good. And this morning we went through a lot of them. So go ahead and, and, and go back and, and check the full, the full reference and see what is this really talking about. Uh, let's see, the next logical fallacy, a false dilemma or a false dichotomy, right? Two options where it's like, like we have Republican, Democrat. How about no? <laughs> how, about, how about those aren't the only two options how about stop giving me just this fake left right false paradigm whereas you know here's here's what they say the two alternative statements are held to be the only possible options when in reality there are more when it comes to doctrines here's the probably one of the most common ones are you calvinist or arminian yep. well you know what i'm neither but people say well oh you're not you're not arminian well you must be calvinist then Oh, you're not Calvinist, then you must be Armenian. Look, that's a false choice. There's more uh, options than just those two. But that's where people will try to just steer you in to one way of thinking. They say, oh, you believe in eternal security, you can't lose your salvation, you must be Calvinist. No, not. Because I don't believe God just picks and chooses who's going to be saved and who isn't. I believe we have free will. Oh, you have free will, so you believe you're Arminian. No, I don't believe I can lose my salvation either. Right. It's a false false dilemma. And that's what that's called. There's a, a inflation of conflict is another one here, arguing that if experts of a field of knowledge disagree on a certain point, the experts must know nothing and therefore no conclusion can be reached or that the legitimacy of their entire field is put into question. So basically what this type of fat logical fallacy is saying that, well, because there's people who disagree in conflict, well, then no one must know what the truth is. Right? right? And that's how people view Christianity today. Well, you guys are all fighting over those. Like, like, I don't think any of you know anything. So it's just the whole thing is just nonsense. Or they'll say kind of the opposite of just, well, everyone just has their own interpretation and opinion. So it's just, it's all true, right? This one is saying, well, it's just all false. But the flip of that, the reverse, which is also a logical fallacy, is saying, well, it's all, it's all just however you want to interpret it then. No, there's right and wrong. Amen. There is absolute truth. That's right. Now, I'm not claiming to be 100% right all the time. That would be really proud of anyone to claim that. But obviously, I think that what I believe is right, because if I didn't, I would change what I thought to try to be in line with what's right. I mean, it makes sense. That should be our goal. We shouldn't try to just stick with something because we like it for some other reason than just that it's true. Right? The goal, we just love the truth. So that's a, another fallacy that you could find. Another one is an intentionality fallacy. So the insistence that the ultimate meaning of an expression must be considered. And I'm sorry for all the, the language used here. I mean, it's, it's, it's not written necessarily in the most easily understood language. But if you, if you listen along carefully, you should be able to get it. It's, it's not that difficult. The insistence that the ultimate meaning of an expression must be consistent with the intention of the person from whom the communication originated. So here's an example that they give. A work of fiction that is widely received as a blatant allegory must necessarily not be regarded as such if the author intended it not to be so. Okay, so what that's saying is if someone writes a story and everyone that reads this story is saying, wow, this is a great allegory of this other truth, but the person who wrote it was like, that's not why I wrote it at all. That's not the point. The fallacy would be saying, oh, well, then we can't use this as an allegory because the author didn't want us to use it that way. 
but that's illogical. That's that's that you can't you know that's that's not a a valid point to make that you can't use something as an allegory. If it's true, it's true, right. right? You can't just say, well, that's not what they wanted. Why am I bringing this point up? Because people will use this to try to refute the inerrancy of the King James Bible in the English language. Right. And the argument that people will say is that, well, even the King James translators, they didn't believe that the work was inerrant and flawless and perfect. They were just trying their best. Okay, and I, and I covered this just like a week ago on a different level on, on Wednesday. But regardless of their intention, it still does not prove or does not mean that it actually isn't so. And, I, and the, what I brought up last time was John the Baptist said he wasn't Elijah, but Jesus said that he was. So it was, it was John the Baptist's intention. He's saying, oh, I'm not Elijah. I'm not him. But Jesus said he was. Jesus is right. John the Baptist was mistaken. He was wrong. That might not have been his intention, but it doesn't matter because that was still the truth. The intention of the King James translators, it might not have been their intention to produce something perfect. They were trying to do something good. They were trying to improve. They were trying to make a, a, a worthy, you know, translation of God's holy word in the English language. And they might have thought that there's still problems with it because they're working as a group. Some one guy might be thinking that, oh, that guy probably screwed up over there or did something wrong and they don't like personally. But they don't have to think that the whole thing is, is flawless in order for it truly to be flawless. It doesn't matter what that person just, their opinion is of thinking that. It would be, it's a fallacy to just say that proves that, it's, that, it, that it has errors. In order to prove it has errors, you have to show an error. That's how you prove it. Not by the intention of the person who worked on it. Make sense? Another logical fallacy is moving the goalposts, also known as raising the bar. So it's an argument in which evidence presented in response to a specific claim is dismissed and some other, often greater evidence is demanded. It's just never enough. Some people, it's never enough, right? You could show them, well, I don't believe that Jesus Christ's soul was in hell for those three days and three nights. Okay, well, how about we look at Acts chapter 2, and I'll show you where the Bible says that his soul was not left in hell, neither his flesh should see corruption. Oh, well, you know, that's not good enough. You, but he didn't suffer in hell. He didn't, you know, and then it's just, well, <laughs> okay, because... Oh, where did I just come up with it? Did I just make this up? I had no. I've had these discussions plenty of times, and no matter what you say, people just are resistant to just. Oh, okay. Well, that's what it actually says. And I'll tell you what: when you see, when I see people like that, I'll move on. I like to talk to people. I like to try to convince people. I like to try to show them evidence and be able to prove my point. But if someone just doesn't want to receive the truth, don't waste your time. Don't waste your time with them. Because it is just a waste of time at that point. When people start adding extra, you know, raising the bar, or moving the goalposts, see ya. Because you know what that shows? There's no intellectual honesty on their part. Amen. You're not interested in knowing what the truth is at that point. Amen. You're either just interested in winning an argument or not losing an argument or just holding on to something that's not true. I have no interest in that foolishness. Proving too much, another fallacy, proving too much. Using a form of argument that, if it were valid, could be used to reach an additional invalid conclusion. So the, the, the evidence or the argument they're presenting, even though they're trying to prove just one small point, if what they're saying would be true, then causes an error somewhere else, that makes that, that argument invalid. It makes that a fallacy. It's not valid. So where do we see this in, in religion or in doctrine? I, th I thought of two things right off the top of my head. Calvinism and dispensationalism. Calvinism wants to prove the, um, how God is all-powerful. Right? And look, that's true. We believe that. God is all-powerful. He's omnipotent. 
He's omnipresent. He's omniscient. He knows all things. He's everywhere. He's all powerful. No argument. And the, and the scripture clearly supports those things. But in their zeal to kind of prove this sovereignty aspect of God, which again, we're not, I'm not saying God's not sovereign of being able to do what he wants to do. They take it an extra step into saying ultimately that because God is so sovereign that nothing happens unless he makes it happen. And that's the proving too much because now all of a sudden what you have is a God that ultimately in that case, that denies free will. If everything bad that happens in the world happens because that's what God wanted to happen, everything from a, from a child being molested to some woman being raped, well, God just wanted that to happen. No. No. That's a different God. So, so they go from one you know, truth, but then end up going too far and end up overreaching and causing problems on their argumentation. Dispensation is the same thing. It's one thing to say, well, things were a little bit different in the Old Testament than they are today. Okay, yeah, they were. Things were a little bit different in the, in the Garden of Eden than they are today. Sure, yeah, they were. Before sin entered into the world, yes, things were a little bit different. But then they take that just observation, which is not even a doctrine, really. I mean, there's, it's just an observation that things have you know, progressed different. The, the biggest doctrine would be maybe Old Testament versus New Testament because there was a significant change there to then saying, oh, well, salvation was different then in the Old Testament. They had to be saved by their works and saved by these blood sacrifices and everything else. No, now you've proven too much. You've gone too far with your thinking of just making these, these different groups of time periods and now starting applying too much to that. And it's just no longer true what you're saying. It's invalid because the Bible teaches that salvation's always been by grace through faith. In the New Testament, it says if, the, if it were possible for the blood of bulls and goats to save, right, then, then, then why would Jesus have to come? If it's possible, then, then Christ died in vain. And what's the point? It was never possible. It's never possible for works to save anyone. It's never possible for shedding the blood of bulls and goats to wash away anybody's sins, ever. Never been the case. I don't care what year you were living in. Let's go on to our next logical fallacy. Faulty generalization. Where a person reaches a conclusion from weak premises. You start with something real weak or real vague, and then you just, you just reach a conclusion off of that. It says, unlike fallacies of relevance and fallacies of defective induction, the premises are related to the conclusions, yet only weakly support the conclusions. A faulty generalization is thus produced. Here's an example that I just saw recently that I saw on the internet that would um, fall into this category of faulty generalization. The faulty generalization was coming from the fact that, you know, Paul, they, they make this, this general statement about the Apostle Paul. Paul was a, uh, a radical of his time, okay? Fair enough, okay, yeah, he was thrown in prison a lot, he was causing a lot of commotion, he was, you know, doing a lot of things. Sure, I can accept that. But the post goes on to explain why Paul was a feminist and an egalitarian. You see the jump. So, so here's the way the argumentation went, is, well, he's this radical and he's also very libertarian. He believes in, this, in people being free from the bondage of sin and stuff. I'm good with that too. You're being free from the bondage of sin. He's kind of a radical and bringing forth ideas that might be new to people and teaching something different, right? In certain aspects. Then the logical leap comes from, well, back in that time when the Romans were under control, women already, they couldn't vote, they couldn't own property, they didn't have all of these rights that men did. So in Ephesians chapter 5, when he's talking about women being in, in submission to their own husbands, 
well, how can he possibly be this radical bringing new ideas if he's basically just saying something that's already accepted at their time? That's weak. That's real weak. Because you're just taking the, the, that in some sense he's a radical and applying that to just everything. And especially when you don't know exactly what the culture was like. You don't know what the religious culture was like. You don't know, and, and that argument took something from the Romans and applied it to Ephesus. Because the letter to the Ephesians came to Ephesians. And what about Coloss the Colossians? Because he says the same thing in Colossians chapter 3. And what about 1 Corinthians chapter 14, where it says it's not permitted for women to speak under the church? You know, how much evidence do you need showing one way, but then you're going to uh, refute all of that by just saying, well, he was a radical. So in order for him to be able to say something radical at the time, it, just can't, it has to be completely different than what everyone believed. So that means everything that he taught just had to be different than everything that anyone ever believed at that time. Otherwise, he's not a radical. Right. Foolishness. Faulty logic, faulty reasoning, generalizations. Watch out for that stuff. Cherry picking. Now, I, I got to cherry picking now. I brought this up earlier. Uh, I, I think everyone knows what cherry picking is. Act of pointing at individual cases or data that seem to confirm a particular position while ignoring a significant portion of related cases or data that may contradict that position. So... Basically, you're picking a few verses out of the Bible that you want to say one thing and just completely ignoring a whole mountain of evidence that says otherwise. These are the people that want to tell you salvation is by works because they're going to go to James chapter 2 right. and say, see, the Bible says faith without works is dead. Right. right? Oh, well, faith without works. Show me thy faith without thy works. I'll show you my faith by my works. Huh? Hmm? Yeah, see? I don't care that you've got a thousand other verses that say salvation is not of works. But I've got two that say that there is works, which they don't really anyways. But that's cherry picking. That's just, oh, we're going to look at this and we're going to look at this. And it's also um, taking them out of context, too, because when you read the whole chapter, you understand what he's referring to. And if they're saying what the work salvation crowd would, thinks that it says, then you've got contradictions in the Bible. Right. Then you've got a faulty Bible because... That would be logically inconsistent to be teaching two completely different things. And then some people try to deal with that by going, oh, well, see, James was talking to the Jews. And then you're segregating different people, even though elsewhere in the Bible it says, well, in Christ there's neither Jew nor Greek, neither Jew nor Gentile. Well, wait a minute then. Well, but the Jews are saved by works. But Christ came unto the Jews so they could be saved through faith. But they're saved by works. It makes no sense. All right, let's continue. Hasty, hasty, so we had faulty generalization, hasty generalization, uh, jumping to conclusions, basically, basing a broad conclusion on a small sample or the making of a determination without all of the information required to do so. Again, the example I just brought up about Paul being this feminist for, you know, all equal rights for women is, would fall under this same type of, of category of just jumping to conclusions. You can't know. From 2,000 years ago, you can't know everything about the culture of that time. You just can't. I mean, you could try to read some books and get some sort of idea, but, but how much really are you going to get? If you read a few books that were written today from our current time, is that going to tell you exactly what the culture is today? What if you read The Art of the Deal and uh, what, was, what was Obama's book? Dreams of, Dreams of My Father, right? <laughs> Which neither of them wrote, by the way, but if you read their books, is that just going to tell you what the whole culture is like in America today? I hope not. <laughs> I, hope not. <laughs> I, I don't know. I didn't read their books, so now I'm, I'm kind of bringing an argument here from, from a lack of foundation, but... I think, I, I, think, I think the point still stands, so forgive me if it's wrong. I'll be honest with you, though. I'll be upfront. I'm not going to pretend that I actually read both of those books. But you know what I'm saying. You, know, the, the, you can't just pick one or two things that you could read and just think that that's going to give you an overall view of what the people were really doing in culture. I mean, even history books. You know, 
you're getting one particular view of a society or whatever that, that somebody is writing down what they think is important. It doesn't really give you the, the culture of, of what's going on. It's, it's just hard to even preserve that through writing. So anyways, let's keep moving on here. I've got some, some more that I want to cover. How am I doing with time? Wow, it's a little bit longer than I thought. All right, appeal. Appeal to the stone is this one. Dismissing a claim as absurd without demonstrating proof for its absurdity. I didn't want to fall for that logical fallacy by just saying that the flat earth is dumb, which is why I spent the time I did this morning. <laughs> to say it's absurd without showing why. Yes, trying to retain some integrity. So don't fall that, you know, and if, if there's someone that believes something that you think is absurd, you know, it's not wrong to think it's absurd. You just got to show why. You can't, you can't just say it's absurd because it's absurd. Right. You, you got to give a reason for it uh, in order for it to be a valid, logical argument that you're making. Argument from ignorance. Assuming that a claim is true because it has not been or cannot be proven false or vice versa. You know, people just want to make claims that just can't be falsified at all. Well, then, in saying it must be true then, that's, uh, that's it's a, it's a fallacy. Arguing from incredulity. Uh, I cannot imagine how this could be true, therefore it must be false. Again, just no evidence, just kind of speculation. There's no way, there's no way that could possibly be true. That doesn't prove that it's not true. I mean, people could use the same thing about the resurrection of Jesus Christ. There's no way that could possibly be true. It doesn't mean it's not true. It really doesn't. Argument from repetition. Uh, repeating an argument until nobody cares to discuss it anymore. Sometimes confused with proof by assertion. Please don't be one of those people. <laughs> That just wants to argue so much that someone just drives with you and you're like, yes, I won. No, no, they just don't want to hear you anymore. That's a, a logical fallacy to think that, that it's, you, you've proven something because they just don't want to hear it. Argument from silence. Assuming that a claim is true based on the absence of textual or spoken evidence from an authoritative source or vice versa. So this is where... You know, like with the flat earth thing this morning, it's like, you know, I see, I see these arguments going, well, where does the Bible say that it's a globe, huh? Right. Well, where, where does it say that? Right. Oh, just do you e send me an email, show me where the Bible says in one place that it's a globe. Well, it doesn't say it's a globe. There's a lot of things that the Bible doesn't say, but it doesn't mean that it's not, you know, that, that concepts aren't taught. It's just, if that's what you're looking for, you're already just setting up something to fail. And that's no good. Or, and just arguing from silence, just some, you can't prove anything from something that's not there. You have to have something to be able to even falsify. You can't just, just have <laughs> nothing. <laughs> okay. It's like saying, my wife didn't tell me she loved me today, so that means she doesn't love me. It's silly. Has nothing to do with whether or not she does. I mean, she, maybe she does. I hope so. <laughs> maybe she doesn't, but I can't say for sure that she doesn't because she didn't say it today. That would be an argument from silence. Uh, red herring. Speaker attempts to distract an audience by deviating from the topic at hand by introducing a separate argument the speaker believes is easier to speak to. Argument given in response to another argument, which is irrelevant and draws attention away from the subject of the argument. So this is where, and, and this is common in preaching. This is common in preaching. Preacher wants to prove the pre-trib rapture, for example. And they'll go off on all these other tangents, on other stuff, and never really come down to proving. But then, and then at the end, it's like, they, they'll take you down these paths and start proving this and proving that. Okay, okay, but you've never... You just completely avoided, well, where does, where does the Bible teach this? You've proven a couple other things, but you didn't really prove your point at all. You've just, you've just brought up something completely different. 
It's like saying, uh, you know, oh, we're not going to go through the tribulation because the Bible says he's not appointing his people into wrath. But we're talking about tribulation. We're not talking about wrath. You can show me all the wrath verses you want in the Bible because we agree with that. We're not appointed unto wrath. God's going to pour out his wrath on the unbelievers. The believers are saved from wrath, but not tribulation. Be of good cheer. In the world you shall have tribulation. In the world you shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I've overcome the world. That's what Jesus said. You shall have tribulation. Look up tribulation. All throughout the scripture. And again, I'm not going to teach. Uh, pretty soon we'll be getting some DVDs in. I'll give you some, some documentaries. We got those YouTube cards out, especially if you're visiting and you, and you don't know what I'm talking about with some of these things. Grab one of those YouTube cards and, and check out the videos that are on that, on that thing. And you'll see what I'm talking about. There's a, a video out there called After the Tribulation that you'll probably enjoy. Ad hominem attack. Uh, this is real common. People usually know what this is. Attacking the arguer instead of the argument. This is where, where people just criticize the person instead of the content, instead of the message, right? You ought to be able to, if you, if you want to argue something or, or, or prove something, you can't, oh, well, that person, they're not good. well, no, let's just take the content. And this is another thing, by the way, with the, with the, that comes up in the flat earth debate. You try to say, well, because the, the big thing they want for is, oh, well, well NASA, there's a big government conspiracy, and you can't trust NASA, and they have these, like, I don't need NASA to prove that the Earth's a globe. People have proven it for thousands of years. Like, like how about we start looking at the physicists and scientists and people just to come before that have used basic trigonometry to prove these things. Oh, but yeah, oh, you're going to trust those, those sodomites, you know, Greek philosophers and stuff. Look, don't, you know, you're not even dealing with the content of what was done. You're just trying to attack the person. And even if the thing's true, when you're just talking about a fact, you should either be able to prove the fact or disprove the fact, regardless of who came up with the idea. Right. Yeah. It's, it, it's irrelevant. Right. I had a conversation today with someone out soul winning that, that you know, we're talking about the kingdom of God. And, and she wasn't trying to be, uh, you know, um, confrontational or, 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 you know, cause problems or anything like that. She was asking questions and Someone told her that, you know, well, did you know that King James, like, murdered somebody? And I forget, I forget what else she said. She said something along those lines. And I was just like, well, first of all, I don't believe that to be true. But second of all, even if he did, that doesn't mean anything as far as the King James Bible being the word of God. Because if you, if you take that approach, well, Moses killed someone with his bare hands. David committed adultery and murder. You could, you could look at all the sins of the people who God used to pen down his word. If you attack the messenger, that doesn't mean that the message itself is untrue. It doesn't. It still makes it true. People try to do that with Solomon and Rehoboam. I've heard that argument also. Because what they don't like is the book of Proverbs that says that if you... If you um, if you spare the rod, that you're gonna, not going to spoil a child. You're going you're gonna, to, um, no, it says, it says, thou shalt not, or thou, thou shalt beat him with the rod and shalt deliver his soul from hell. That's one place. There's, there's a few places where the Bible talks about disciplining your children. And what I've seen is these logical fallacies of saying, oh, but look at how Solomon's son turned out. He didn't turn out like Solomon did, right? And they'll start making these attacks on his son and saying, see? So what, what Solomon was teaching in the Proverbs must not be true because they didn't like how, how Rehoboam came out. Now, first of all, the Bible doesn't give us very much information about how Rehoboam turned out as a son with his father. We don't see any deception and, and Rehoboam stabbing his father in the back or anything like that. He made some poor choices as a king, but we don't see him doing anything, you know, that, that, would, that would show this, this problem of him being some problem child within the family. So first of all, that doesn't prove anything. But second of all, is it the word of God or not? I mean, these people, they don't like God's word so much that they're going to attack Solomon, who is the human instrument to write down God's word instead of the actual message itself. It's a logical fallacy. It's an ad hominem attack. 
poisoning the well, a subtype of ad hominem, presenting adverse information about a target person with the intention of discrediting everything that the target person says. This is exactly what people are doing with Pastor Anderson. They just want to throw everything that they can at him so that nobody will listen to anything he has to say, regardless of, of the actual content of what's being said. And you know what? They'll try to do that to me. They'll try to do that to you. That's what the, the news article was all about a few months ago here. Just trying to discredit the, the things that, that I say and trying to bring a smear and a slander on my name. I mean, that's, people have been doing that for a long time. Poisoning the well. But that's also why it's so important to live a, 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 you know, a life above reproach, too. Now, people are going to lie about you. There's nothing you can do about that. I mean, that's, that, is, that is what it is. But if you can at least just demonstrate, hey, I'm doing what's right, and not be found guilty of, of whatever, right? A, all manner of sin that, that is destroying lives and churches on a regular basis. I mean, read about the, the pedophile pastors and, and all this other nonsense. Wickedness. Not just nonsense, wickedness. That poisons the well. Man, I've talked to people out soul winning. I'm never going to church again. Because something that they, that, that they had to deal with in the church that they went to. And that's sad. But I'm, I think I'm getting a little bit off of my, my uh, logical reasoning here on that. Uh, appeal to authority. We're almost done. There's only a few left. An assertion is deemed true because of the position or authority of the person asserting it. Just... And this is what I was saying before. Well, the pastor said this, so it must be true. No. No, that, that's not true. And I, being the pastor of this church, I don't want you to have that idea. Please don't just say, well, pastor said this, so it must be true. Now, it doesn't mean you just don't give any weight to what's being taught, but it, does, but it also doesn't just prove, well, if so-and-so said it, then it just must be true. No. You shouldn't have that attitude about anybody. That's when you start getting into cult territory. That's, right. That's, That's scary. Yeah. Amen. Appeal to emotion. An argument is made due to the manipulation of emotions rather than the use of valid reasoning. You know, I've seen this done in churches a lot too where people will have this real dramatic type of preaching and unfortunately sometimes it's on the right things. It's on something that might be good but they're just not doing a good job of proving it and just completely relying on the emotions of people. And we don't want to do that either. It doesn't mean that preaching never gets emotional. It doesn't mean that you can't be passionate about the truth. But if you're trying to prove something, then you need to use evidence. You need to use scripture. Uh, almost an association fallacy, guilt by association and honor by association, arguing that because two things share or are implied to share some property, that they are the same. That's like saying, oh, we well, are just like the Catholics, right? Guilt by association. Well, you believe in the Trinity, they believe in the Trinity, so you're just like, you're just like a Catholic. No. No, we share these, these two properties. We're different on all these other areas. You know, that doesn't just mean, well, you're just like them. Or you must just be that. Illogical. Totally invalid. And then the last one I have is a straw man fallacy, which hopefully you're all already familiar with that. It's an argument based on a misrepresentation of an opponent's position. So where you're saying, oh, well, here's why. If I were to say, here's why the flat earth theory is just false, because they actually believe the moon's made out of green cheese, and they believe that there's a turtle, you know, that would be misrepresenting their case. And, and you know what? I don't want to do that because if I'm trying to prove something, I'm going to shoot my own credibility down because people are going to realize that. Now, you may convince some people, oh man, they believe that, but that's not the right way of doing it and it's just, just logically false. It's not the right way of doing it. You, you know? So when I preach against things, when I preach against doctrines or against other religions or whatever it is that I'm trying to teach and preach and show and expose, why is this way false and why is this way true? I spend time doing the research to try to figure out because I don't want to misrepresent people. I don't want to say things that is not true to their belief system because it doesn't do anybody any good to just make up something to knock it down that nobody believes. 
Now, there are some times where people might think you're building a straw man because they don't like the terms that you use, even though it is correctly showing or um, um, describing what they believe when you take it to its conclusion. The people who say you have to repent of your sins in order to be saved, and you, uh, what does that mean? Well, you got, you got to give up your sins. You got, you know, they may not like you saying, well, that's a work salvation. Oh, no, but I don't believe in works. But keeping the commandments and stopping sinning is works according to the Bible, and it can be proven. So just because you don't like that, that, that label doesn't make it invalid, and it doesn't make it a straw man. What would make it a straw man is just completely fabricating something that isn't true about what they believe and just and, and knocking that down with scripture. So those are all the fallacies. And that's not all the There's a lot of different logical fallacies. But I want you to be aware of these different things and how it applies to doctrine, how it applies to, to what you hear, what you hear preached, just to help you grow in your learning and be able to challenge things and be able to present good argumentation because this is important. I mean, if you, if you are really interested in impacting of the lives of other people and helping other people out and using the Bible and trying to get people saved, you need to be getting better and increasing at how you can prevent, present information and just being more effective. Because people will respond to truth when you're doing it the right way. They do. People respond to the truth. Some people just want to be told lies. That's fine. Whatever. Keep going to Joel Osteen's church. You'll be, you'll be, you'll be happy there, but happy with the, the pastor that says peace, peace, when there is no peace. But there's always going to be people like that. And we're going to try to reach as many as we can, but if they don't want to hear it, fine, we'll move on to someone else. There's a lot of people here. A lot of people in this city. A lot of people in, in this area. Lots of people to reach. Let's do our best to stay, have integrity, have honesty, and to just get some intelligence with the Word of God. Study to show thyself approved, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed. Approved unto God, by the way. Study, study to show thyself approved unto God. I misquoted that verse. As far as I have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for... Um, for sharing uh, or preserving, excuse me, preserving your word for us and giving us this, this wisdom and this knowledge that's contained in your words. God, help us to understand it better. Help us to, um, to continue to grow and to learn. And, and Lord, I pray that you would just um, help us all in our zeal and our desire to, to do your will, to, to be used of you, dear God, to, that you would, you would help increase our knowledge, our understanding and that we would not make these mistakes so that our testimonies can be um, solid and, and, and proven, dear Lord. And we love you and we thank you for, for, um, for our salvation and all that you do for us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.